Ace Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Vaguely Accurate. Today's preface, we're going to get straight into it. Our food for thought to share with your friends and family at the dinner table is given to us by Nerdy Words. They are a Ace Podcast network show. Three guys give their two cents on heroes, games, and all things entertainment and nerdy. I really enjoy this. I'm a bit of a geek myself, so check them out. And like always, see if they're your cup of tea. Their tabletop fact for us, or factoid, is that the embryos of most animals, humans, other mammals, birds, reptiles, etc., look so similar in their early stages that it's almost impossible for an untrained individual to tell them apart. Which would be really awkward if you took your babies home from a hospital at that stage, because you might end up with reptile child. It's a little weird. Um, anyway, today's episode, we have Mark Zimmett. He is a particle physicist, or an atomic physicist to be precise, uh, looking into collision theory. He is current. He is a post-PhD researcher. He is now employed at a nuclear fusion reactor. All anyway, right, so let's uh, get into this episode. And as always, let us know what you think. If you have any questions, shoot them my way and I'll see what I can do. Hello. Hey, Mark. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Thank you very much for coming on the show. It's really appreciated. Would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself and what is physics to you? Yeah. Um, so my name is Mark Zammert and I'm 27 years old. I graduated with a PhD last year and I'm currently working at Los Alamos National Laboratory in the United States and I'm a a physicist working on modeling interactions between matter, so atoms, how they interact with other atoms and their constituents. You did your um, PhD on collision theory. Yeah, so could you explain to us what exactly is collision theory? Like, um, I've got an idea, but I'm not too sure myself. <laughs> so basically, collision theory is um, how to model what happens when, say, an electron interacts with an atom. So it comes close enough to interact in some way, so it might get scattered off in a particular direction. It might hit the atom and leave some of its energy behind and scatter off. And our job is to calculate the probability of what will happen during that collision. Will the electron, say, go straight through? Will the electron get scattered off at 90 degrees? Will it deposit a certain amount of energy to ionize the atom? So yeah. that's our job is to calculate that probability. So it's essentially like doing uh, chemistry, like quantitative chemistry. So how do you how do you calculate the probability of interactions? With a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, well, we're lucky in our field. So in atomic physics, all the interactions between our charged particles are known. It's just the Coulomb potential. So we have the advantage over nuclear physicists there who don't know all their potentials. Um, what we do is we solve the Schrodinger equation for the, for the scattering system. And our job is to analyze the, or to try and solve for the total scattering wave function, which is the main function that you try <laughs> and solve in a Schrodinger equation. Yeah. And that's, that's basically an equation which conserves energy and it describes all positions of the particles as a probability function. Okay. So when you yeah. said nuclear physicists don't have the properties to determine probability, um, what exactly are you referring to there? So uh, I'm not a huge expert in nuclear physics, but yep. some of the potentials that um, nuclear physicists use aren't known. You can't write them down on a piece of paper. Okay. Um, so they have to do a bit of guessing sometimes and they try and match with the experiment to try and figure out if the interaction that they're, they're using in their models is correct. So it's sort of work, you work backwards almost. What got you interested in collision theory itself? So when I was doing my undergraduate studies, I got interested in research from my sister 
And uh, I went around asking all my professors and tutors what research they do, what they're working on, stuff like that. And I ended up meeting one of my supervisors, Eagle Ray, who told me about collision theory, the method that they use, which is essentially uh, an exact formalism. And what they calculate is applicable to lots of different fields. And the main one which grabbed my attention was fusion technology. The goal of of fusion is to recreate the sun, basically, and harness its energy to produce electricity. Um, It's like the next generation of nuclear power that is essentially clean. There's not much radioactive um, byproducts. It's environmentally friendly, and you basically get the fuel from seawater and lithium, which are pretty much inexhaustible fuels on this planet. <laughs> so it should last us millions of years if if we get it up and running. That's really what That's attracted me, is that involvement in the fusion technology projects and the involvement with ITER. So with, um, I suppose, just for any listeners, I know this can come across as quite an in-depth question, um, but could you give us like a fusion and fission 101? So nuclear power right now is done mostly by nuclear fission, um, and you're working on yep. the largest project for nuclear fusion, if I'm correct. Could you give us a 101 quick minute or two on what's, what is fission, what is fusion, what's the difference? Yeah. Okay, so nuclear fission is um, when humans were able, well, not humans, but nuclear fission is basically what happens when an atom is split. And that releases a whole bunch of energy, basically. Uh, So basically, nuclear fusion is when two nuclei come together and fuse. This usually happens between, um, well, most efficiently between deuterium, which is an isotope of hydrogen. So that's one proton and one neutron. And tritium, which is one proton and two neutrons. So they behave like hydrogen on the sort of atomic scale, but... On the nuclear scale, they behave differently. And when they come together and fuse, they can fuse to form a heavier nuclei, so two protons and two neutrons, so that's a helium atom. And in that reaction, a neutron is also emitted, as well as a whole bunch of energy. Um, And that is more efficient than nuclear fission. What seemed to be is more efficient that way. Basically, our sun is one big fusion reactor. It fuses hydrogen, helium, all the small elements, and basically creates heavier elements. So when you said, I suppose, on a nuclear scale, this may come across as a daft question, but what do you mean by a nuclear scale as opposed to atomic scale? Okay, so it basically determines the amount of distances between particles or between things. So atomic physicists, well, someone like me would work somewhere between, um, well, we work on the Bohr scale, which is like 10 to the minus 11 meters or so. Nanotechnology people, I think, work between 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 9 meters. This is like the distance between atoms or molecules or things like that. Whilst nuclear physicists have to deal on the scale of distances between particles within the nuclei. I wouldn't know off the top of my head how close they are, but they are a lot <laughs> much shorter distances compared to, say, a proton and an electron in a hydrogen atom. Yeah. And that's where the, yeah. I suppose, inconsistency comes in terms of nu- looking at nuclear science. They're not too sure on the probability of reactions because the scale is just that yeah. smaller. It, it's too small and it's very hard to, to test these things as well. Yeah, going back to, uh, I suppose, your research, did you do your honours project on collision theory or something similar? And when you were doing your research, what was the methodology you used for your PhD? <clears throat> so in my honours, I did do... Yeah, I did my honours project on collision theory again, um, and that was on looking at collisions in a in a plasma, which is something that you know the sun is, and what they would use to make fusion reactions. And the methodology we use is, as I was saying, is trying to solve this Schrödinger equation for the for the scattering system, so all the particles that are involved in the collision, and we do that by just using quantum mechanics. A bunch of maths and programming and supercomputers, basically. So a lot of new, um, numerical modeling going on. And... Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, everything we do is on the computer. No, a few analytics, but not too many. <laughs> Did you find there were any limitations when you were doing your research? Mostly time. 
time on on my side and also computing time so that we we don't have all the access we would like to supercomputers. Yeah. Um, so that's a bit of a limitation, uh, particularly for what was my PhD project, which was on scattering from molecules. So they have an added complexity of vibrational motion and rotational motion compared to atoms, which are just a fixed center. Yeah. So you need a lot more computing power for those types of problems. Wouldn't that yeah. be so nice when quantum computing comes about? Just everything happens that much faster. That, that would be lovely, but I don't think <laughs> we'll get there anytime soon. Um, you mentioned the uh, what interested you in collision theory was the applications uh, before. So uh, what applications are there? You've mentioned nuclear fusion, but is there like medical applications like radiation therapy? Um, is your model able to improve the efficiency of those? Set? Yeah, definitely. So um, uh, radiation therapy is one direction that my research group back in Perth is going into. So there's a type of radiation therapy called proton therapy, which is um, you basically have a beam of protons that shoot into the body. And the nice thing about those uh, particles compared to other particles that they currently use for radiation therapy is that they can predetermine where most of the energy of that beam will be deposited within the body. Unfortunately, that's not the case for some other um, methods that they use, like x-rays, for example. Mm-hmm. X-rays go straight through the body, so there's a almost equal probability that the energy will be deposited at all these distances. Um, whilst protons, you can basically adjust the, your beam energy and it will go to a particular depth that you would like and deposit all its energy around the cancer site. So our job is to tr- provide uh, what we call cross sections, but like the probability that these protons will interact with water molecules or other molecules within the body and try and uh, figure out how far that beam will actually get into the body from our modeling methods. As well as that, we can also try and determine what happens, say, if a proton hits a you know, water molecule, it might ionize it. That electron can then go off and hit other molecules within the body. And what happens then? Like, Where does that energy go? So Sorry? That's called secondary ionization, isn't it? So it can happen by basically all sorts of particles. They so usually call them like... Um, an electron shower, I think they call them. So basically, you have one particle comes in, ionizes that particle, it goes off, ionizes something else, whilst the electron that originally got knocked out of the molecule goes off and hits another molecule and starts another ionization shower. But it can lead to all sorts of other processes as well, which can be dangerous. So one of the more dangerous processes that can happen is that uh, some of the molecules can actually grab one of the electrons, say, that were were ionized, grab it and bind it to the molecule, and then it will disassociate. Um, And there was a paper in Science, which has been cited a whole bunch of times, (laughs) maybe thousands of times, which shows that that is leads to DNA damage, basically. So moving on a little bit, like you finished uh, your PhD and you received an award. Um, is that an award from Curtin itself or is that an industry-funded award? And what did that um, mean for you? I think it was a, a industry-funded award which was organized by the Western Australian government. So it was the 2014 ExxonMobil Student Scientist of the Year Award. It was organized by the Office of Science, and they're called the Premier Science Awards. And um, the one that I was awarded was funded by ExxonMobil. Congratulations. And that, thank you. And that was for work done during my PhD and during my honors and undergraduate as well. I assume that and your work efficiently led to a, a job. I suppose, um, which is a nice rarity at the moment and in science. It's great to hear that someone's actually gone and got a PhD and worked straight after it. So you said you're working on ITAR, which is a nuclear fusion reactor. Could you give us a bit of description about what ITAR is itself? Okay, so it is a huge science experiment, which is trying to test whether nuclear fusion is a feasible technology to produce this you know, sort of power for electricity generation. And it's in collaboration with at least 20 countries, maybe more. 
and thousands of scientists are working on it. And the goal, yeah, is basically to produce this fusion. My job, I guess, during this project is to <clears throat> determine the fundamental collisions which will be happening inside this reactor. So this reactor will be a giant plasma, which is, um, for those who don't know, it's a gas of partially ionized atoms and molecules. And within this plasma, you'll have free electrons or protons or atoms and molecules going around colliding with each other. So our job is to calculate the probability of these things colliding with each other and what will happen. Where will that energy go? So our job is to provide these, these cross-sections or probabilities, and then they will be used by people called plasma modelers who will take this data and then run their models to try and determine what, how this plasma will actually behave. So we are on the very you know, ground floor, basically. You're on like, the fundamental level. Yeah. The fundamental level, that's right. You'll not be able to determine what will happen within the plasma just from the data that we generate until you run these other models. But those models require our data. Now the, um, I was looking into the ITAR project after you sent it to me. It's in both scale and, I suppose, application, it's rather impressive. Yeah. Like, not only were you talking about, you know, the advantages, like, so, like, lithium, there's pretty much inexhaustible amounts. It's like, you know, if if not terrestrial, you've got sea floor stuff. It do, it's, doesn't produce any CO2. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it says no long-lived radioactive waste. When you say no long-lived radioactive waste, so there is still a waste product that is produced? Yeah. So during these sorts of collisions and things, you'll be having high-energy neutrons going off and um, gamma rays, which will be going off. And they can then be captured by other sorts of you know, elements. So the main use of lithium is that it will produce tritium, which is also which is the actual fuel inside the plasma. Yeah. So what happens there is that the plasma is going to be covered by a lithium blanket, they call it. Yep. As the neutrons escape the plasma, they're going to be hitting the lithium blanket, which will produce a lithium isotope and then decay into tritium. And somehow they're going to collect that tritium and then inject it back into the plasma. That's a, a radioactive material then, basically. It's capturing energy and it's got excess energy, so I would like to release it somehow. So that's radiation. For this thing to work efficiently, they basically need to use light elements. And light elements usually have a shorter half-life. So the actual machine itself, donut shaped vacuum chamber, but it's called a tokamak, is that correct? Is that pronounced right? That's right. And like the plasma itself is heated up to 150 million degrees. Like that's hot. Yeah. That's definitely one of the challenges is how can you contain, say, like this 150 million degree substance, you know, within walls and the walls then have to be, you know, at room temperature within a few meters or so. Do they have that's a method for that? One of the main main issues i guess so there's a couple of things that they use so they're using um i believe beryllium coating on the walls which is what's used for i think it's an aerospace material mm -hmm. basically it's light which i was saying like these light element is one of the, the useful properties in this machine um and it's also got a high resistance to you know to temperature yeah um but the the major thing so why it's shaped like a donut and everything like that is that there's going to be magnets surrounding this donut and these magnets will keep all the charged particles within this sort of vacuum without escaping that itself sounds well ignoring the whole complexity side of it are there any dangers with that because nuclear power stations there's you know there's been a few catastrophes yeah with nuclear fusion and this uh, tokamak itself having that heat and that pressure that's associated with it contained within the site is there a potential for any mistakes errors or catastrophes to emerge from that especially if a magnet was to fail for it i'm sure they have fail safes in theory yeah as far as i know so things can definitely go wrong they can always go wrong um but if there's like, as you're saying, like a catastrophe, like nuclear power plants, I don't think that there will be um, on that scale. Say if something like a magnet fails, my understanding is that if you have some leakage of the plasma, it will then affect the rest of the plasma and the whole thing will just cool down um, significantly. So it won't be able to get out of control because you, you need these sorts of high temperatures and densities to sustain the fusion reaction inside it. As soon as you break those conditions, 
you're losing that fuel source. So as soon as you break those conditions, the whole reaction should basically shut off. It's got its own sort of fail-safe in that sense, yeah. How did you get the job? Well, I was quite lucky. I had some good thesis supervisors who um, asked all their colleagues to, to look for a job for me. Oh, fantastic. And, That's always um, nice. I was lucky, <laughs> yeah. So I was lucky enough that my boss here, he had some, some money or was looking to hire a postdoc. Um, so th- that's pretty much how it went, just word of mouth and telling people that you know, they had a student that needs a job and I'm sure they said that I was okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so I think that's how it really goes is as soon as like, you know, people talk to each other and stuff like that, it's really who you know rather than... Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. How are you finding America? And more importantly, how do you find the research environment in the USA in comparison compared right. to Oz? The, well, the research environment that I'm in is at a national lab, which I think is quite different compared to a university or something typical like that. The lab employs around 10,000 people, so it's a massive institution, and a lot of those people have PhDs. So I'd say that the, the institution itself, it's completely multidisciplinary. Lots of people that are yeah, doing different things. You can go to talks every day on different subjects and stuff like that That's awesome. um they yeah they have um experiments here which you know we probably only have a couple in australia there's probably like dozens on this site here it's a very different different sort of lifestyle and an area and culture yeah. um, it's quite nice yeah and then move into america in itself which has got a very different lifestyle culture and then getting this whole kind of unique village of intellectuals and academics together. I can imagine yeah. it being quite a, quite a step out of place. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this place is in the, the desert as well and in the mountains. So that regard is, is sort of similar. So it's similar to Perth that there's desert surrounding it, but <laughs> mountains are, are not something that I've seen much of or snow. So I'm looking forward to that. Hey, you get snow as well. Yeah. Yeah, okay. definitely get a lot of snow here. There's a s- snow hill and an ice rink and stuff like that. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Like CERN, once the media grabbed attention, of, or grabbed hold of that, they kind of get, came up with the whole theory. When CERN gets turned on, there's going to be a huge black hole and it's going to engulf the Earth. Has there yet, or is there, if there were to be, a post uh, an apocalyptic scenario just to derive from this project or your research field in collision theory itself yeah have you got have you got an idea of what one could potentially be yeah i I thought about this a little bit and um my (laughs) immediate sort of thought went to um antimatter so another thing that we we model collisions of is collisions of antimatter with normal matter um and so for example we we model how a positron, which is an anti-electron, will collide with atoms or some water molecule or something, and that's supposed to be useful in PET scans. Um, so my immediate thought was to have a large amount of massive antimatter somehow let loose in full at once into <laughs> a room or <laughs> or into a place with normal matter, um, and that would cause some sort of explosion. That actually is off a, a movie as well, which, um, have you seen Angels and Demons? No, is that the Dan Brown book? Yeah. Yeah, no, I haven't seen it. I've, I've seen it out and it's just kind of been sitting there on my to-do list at some point. Is that generally okay. the well, plot of the movie? Well, yeah, the, the plot of the movie is about some terrorist attack and like a bunch of antimatter, I think, is stolen from CERN. And so <laughs> they're scared that this antimatter is going to be like released. And then, you know, there's going to be a giant explosion. I won't ruin the movie, but... (laughs) No. Yeah. (laughs) um, When you say giant explosion, just out of curiosity for me, um, if you had a whole room of antimatter that went off, would it just be more of an instant vaporization of just matter and antimatter kind of neutralized and just non-existence of that what was once existing? What What would happen? Yeah. Well, basically, when antimatter annihilates with normal matter, it releases um, photons, so light, and that's pretty much energy. Um, But if you had a whole room full of antimatter, and I'm guessing you mean like solid antimatter, so like large amounts of mass, I think that would at least destroy the planet. (laughs) Um, The... (laughs) I think that there's some um, statistic like if you had one gram of antimatter, that's enough fuel to take you to out of space or something. From oh, the wow. Planet. 
any chance of harvesting yes. that for our energy needs? <laughs> uh, it's not easy. <laughs> At the moment, CERN is trying to produce anti-hydrogen. They have done that, but you know, not for very long. Not overly stable. Or, isn't it? Yeah, or not for you know in large quantities. But the goal is to try and make large quantities to try and see how it actually behaves first before we can harness. So these are all very alternative energy sources as opposed to renewable energy. They're just very powerful alternative sources, I suppose, that could maybe one day harness in the future. Yeah, yeah, maybe in the <laughs> very distant future. Yeah, maybe not in our lifetimes. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for coming on the show. Do you happen to have any take-home messages for anyone who might be studying physics or could be interested in the work you do or even any um, affiliations you support? If, so, if somebody wants to read up a bit more on my work, there's a few um, articles on the internet that I, I can send you that you know might be interested to people interesting for people that they're sort of like PR articles uh, in terms of a take-home message if you're interested in science and you want to develop a career out of it make sure that you are happy with your supervisors and actually research about your supervisors to make sure that they're they're quite good I was very lucky I think with the supervisors I got they were very helpful very knowledgeable good standing in the field and they did try and help me after my PhD to get a job not all supervisors are like that. So it's, <laughs> That's a great thing. Having the yeah, support it, it from your was peers. a very nice thing, especially in a PhD when you're stressing out to try and finish your thesis. Definitely um, recommend looking into your supervisors carefully. So everyone, that was Mark Zamet. I'd like to thank Mark for coming on the show and teaching us what you know. And I'd like to thank you guys for listening again. As always, if you want to give us your feedback or give us a factoid for featuring future episodes, get in contact with us via most social media platforms. I will be putting up Mark's uh, article on the website, so you definitely check that out, vaguelyaccurate.com. And yeah, I can't wait to see what nuclear fusion does for us in the future. I hope you enjoyed the show, guys. Take care.